In this lecture, we're going to talk about statically indeterminate axially loaded structures. And uh, first, we need to talk about what indeterminate means in the context of statics. So if you have a structure where you can find all the forces in the structure by using statics, then that is statically determinate. But if the forces in the structure cannot be determined by statics alone, then the structure is said to be statically indeterminate. So let's uh, give a couple of examples of each situation. So previously we had studied structures that look like this, a stepped shaft. Where we had a segment on the left and a segment on the right. They were joined together. And uh, I'm just going to put a load here, maybe 10 kilonewtons. If I wanted to find out what the forces were in section 1 and section 2, I would make a free body cut. Let me uh, change to a different color here. And I would cut inside section 2, and I would cut inside section 1, and I would draw the corresponding free body diagrams. Now in section 2, since there's no force applied on the end, F2 would be equal to 0. And for section number 1, we could find out the forces by drawing the free body diagram and looking at everything to the right of that cut. Now at the junction, I have my 10 kilonewton applied load, and then I have my internal force, F1. Now, by the summation of forces in the x direction, F1 would be equal to 10 kilonewtons. So, by definition, then, this would be a statically determinant structure. Now, let's give an example of a statically indeterminant structure that looks very similar to this. Instead of having one wall on the left side, we can take the same structure and fix it in between two walls. We can even put the same load on it, so that's a 10 kilonewton load. If we go to draw the free body diagram of the structure, there will be a force reaction on the left side and a force reaction on the right side, which we won't know right off the bat, and we have our 10 kilonewton applied force. When we write down the summation of forces equation, we're going to have minus FL plus 10 plus FR is equal to zero. We have two unknowns, and we have one useful equation, summation of forces in the x direction. And if we take the difference between those two, 2 minus 1 is 1, we would say we have one degree of indeterminacy. Now, we all know that we can't solve two equations. Uh, we can't solve one equation and two unknowns. We need two equations and two unknowns. The degree of indeterminacy tells me the number of extra equations that we need to use. Now, uh, uh, a quick word about the reactions that I have here. Since this is only axial loading on the structure, and that's the section that we're, we're talking about, uh, I don't have any moment reactions or torque reactions or forces going vertically. So my only reactions on the left and right side will be in the axial direction. Now, to distinguish between external reactions and internal forces in the bars, I use letters as subscripts. So FL is an external reaction. FR is an external reaction. Internal forces, I'm going to use numbers for my subscripts. The force inside bar 1 is F1. The force inside bar 2 is F2. Now, sometimes the force F1 and F2 are the same as the external reactions, sometimes not. Okay, so this is an example of a statically indeterminate structure. So let's just make a note of that uh, right now.
And the way to check is to draw that free body diagram, write down your equilibrium equations, and, and count up the unknowns. Now there are some, some basic approaches that we can take to generate our extra equation. And that kind of depends somewhat on the problem geometry. Um, I like to classify these types of problems in three ways. Materials in series, materials in parallel, and something called similar triangles. But uh, the, the basic approach is the other equation comes from what's called the geometry of deformation. It's a kinematic relationship uh, that, that, that constrains the deformation or the displacement of points on the structure. So let's write that down. The extra equation comes from geometry of deformation. And the fancy word for that is kinematics. So let's talk about some basic kinematic relationships. And like I said, I like to break these up into uh, three general classifications, one uh, of which I'll call materials in series. Now, materials in series is kind of like uh, thinking of it as springs in series with one another. We have a couple of springs in series, and maybe they have different spring constants. The total change in length of the system will be equal to the change in length of spring 1 plus the change in length of spring 2. The, the same thing happens in a system uh, like this, where we have bar 1 and bar 2. And we talked about this last time. The total deformation is equal to the deformation of bar 1 and bar 2. Now, in, in the example that I just drew, that is a statically determinant situation. So if we look at the statically indeterminate materials in series, that would be like we have two springs fixed in between two walls, or uh, this situation. where we have a load applied in the middle of, a, of a two bars. Now, it doesn't have to be two bars. It can be three or four or however many. But that, that assembly is stuck in between those two walls. Now, if the wall on the left doesn't move and the wall on the right does not move, then the total deformation is going to be zero. In this case, now this is separate from the one I have above. In this case, the total deformation which is equal to E1 plus E2, would be equal to zero. Now that helps us because we know how to find little E1 and little E2 by using what's called the load deformation relationship. We can replace these with FL over AE for each respective segment. And in these types of problems, typically you would know the material properties, the E, the lengths of the bars in a way to calculate the areas. The unknowns right now would be the forces F1 and F2. So this is one equation that we have that has two unknowns, F1 and F2. Let me circle them in red. Our second equation that has F1 and F2 comes from the statics. Now we drew on the previous page our free body diagram. And I said I have my force on the left, and I have my reaction force on the right, and here's my applied force P. And we can write down an equilibrium equation from the summation of forces in the x direction that says minus FL plus P plus FR is equal to zero. Well, now it looks like we've got four unknowns. We have a force on the left, a force on the right, F1 and F2. but we can relate the reactions to the forces inside of each bar. So let me label these 1 and 2. If we make a free body cut inside section 1 and draw everything to the left, we will see pretty quickly that F1 is equal to the reaction force on the left. 
If I were to cut this and draw this, uh, I'm going to draw it over here. I'm going to draw this to the right. We can see pretty quickly that the force on the right is going to have to balance with the internal force F2. So F2 is equal to FR. So now we have two equations and two unknowns. Now, you may also say, well, why did I cut and look to the left on one side? Why did I cut and look on the right on the other one? You will get the same result no matter which side you look at. So let's take uh, piece number two. Instead of cutting it and looking to the right, I could have cut this and looked to the left. Now, when I drew these free body di diagrams, I have to draw everything to one side or the other. So this would be what my free body diagram would look like. I'd have my internal force F2. Notice how I've drawn these equal and opposite. That's that Newton's law thing. Uh, and then uh, I have to include the force on the left and the applied force P. Now, if you look at this equilibrium equation, summation of forces in the x direction, we got minus FL plus P plus F2 is equal to zero. I would have F2 is equal to FL minus P. And you might say, well, that's not what I got on the other picture. On the other picture, I got F2 is equal to FR. But if we realize that this equilibrium equation says the same thing as this one, okay? remember the force on the right is the same thing as F2, this says FR is equal to FL minus P. Well, now it's the same thing. So it, it doesn't matter if the, bar is in, uh, if the bar is in equilibrium. It doesn't matter if you cut and look to the left or cut and look to the right. As long as you're careful and consistent, you will get the same equilibrium equations. So now let me uh, write over here. our two equations, our statics equation says that F2 is equal to the force on the left, which is F1 minus P. And our geometry of deformation equation says F1 L1 over A1 E1 plus F2 L2 over A2, E2 is equal to zero. And that gives us two equations and two unknowns, assuming that our unknowns are the forces and we know everything else. Now to solve these two equations and two unknowns, you can do it the usual way. You can substitute one in for the other and get an equation all in terms of one variable. There's something I'd like to show you that, that makes these problems a little bit easier. If I start with equation number two, and I solve for F1. I can write these terms in ratios of the dimensions. So on the right-hand side, I need to make sure I put a negative sign here. On the right-hand side, I have minus F2. And I have L2 divided by L1. If I cross multiply, I have A1 divided by A2. And I have E1 divided by E2. If I know the dimensions, then... I don't have to worry so much about the exact units everything is in, as long as they're in the same thing on the top and on the bottom, like lengths and meters on the top and meters on the bottom. If area is in square millimeters on the top and square millimeters on the bottom, then those units will cancel out. So now I take this and I plug this back into equation one. And if I know the value of the force P, I can find the value of the forces that are applied to the structure. We'll go through an example with some numbers in it uh, after we talk about the other two types of kinematic relationships. The second type of kinematic relationship that we're going to talk about is materials in parallel. Now, uh, uh, the picture that I'm drawing here is trying to show a material where I have a core and a sleeve. There's actually two materials in this picture. So I have a core, I'm going to call that material one, and I have a sleeve that I'll call material two.
And, and the, the deal with this is that these two materials are bonded together. That's going to be the assumption. And you can do that. You can do something called shrink fitting, which tightly wraps a sleeve around a core of a different material. But the, the, the kinematic relationship that results from that is that when I pull on this structure, both materials stretch out the same amount. I call this materials in parallel because it's kind of like we have a spring above and below in a rigid plate, and we're pulling on this rigid plate, and we're making sure that they both have the same amount of displacement. When we do that, the forces in each individual spring are going to be different. If they have the same displacement in different spring constants, they'll have different forces. Same thing's going to happen in our composite bar. Some examples, some books use rebar in concrete. It doesn't have to be a round bar. You can have a, a, a core material and a sleeve material. There's different ways that you can set these kind of problems up. But the kinematic relationship then is that the deformations are the same. In other words, little e1 is equal to little e2. Now, since in this sketch, the, the cross-section, the forces, and the material properties are constant for each component, the core or the sleeve, then we don't have to do an integral. We can write down our equation, FL over AE for section 1 is equal to FL over AE for section 2. In these problems, we usually know the lengths, the areas, the material properties. We don't usually know the forces, so those are, these are our unknowns. I'll circle them again in red. Our unknown is the force F1 and F2. So right now we have two unknowns, but one equation. Our second equation comes from statics. We have to be a little bit careful here when we do our statics. If we were to draw an overall free body diagram of the structure, we draw this flat. We would have an applied load P, and yes, at the wall, we would have an equal and opposite reaction load P at that wall. That is a fine free body diagram, but it is not useful for our purposes. For our purposes, we want a free body diagram that will tell us how the applied load relates to the internal forces F1 and F2. The way that we do that is if we make a free body cut somewhere in between where the wall is and where that load is applied. So the useful free body diagram is going to be this picture that I'm going to draw right here. And the resultant of my forces are through the centroid, so they're both uh, coaxial, F1 and F2. So this is going to be the useful free body diagram for this case. My equilibrium equation, the summation of forces in the x-direction, if I look at that, uh, it says F1 plus F2 is equal to P. Another way to think of this is that both of those materials share the load. We should never get a force F1 or F2 that is higher than the applied load. That's just impossible for this kind of situation. All right, so that's uh, materials in parallel. Now, like we did before, if we want to go to solve the problem, I know these are just symbols, but we'll put some numbers in for an example later. If we want to solve this, what I would recommend would be separating this up, solving our top equation, number one, so that we have L2 over L1, A1 over A2, E1 over E2, and then if you have the numbers for that, of course, the lengths will cancel out in this problem. Insert into equation 2. Once you find the forces, then we can answer all kinds of other questions. What's the total stretching of this composite bar? 
what is the strain in each material, what is the stress in each material, and, and so forth. All right, now the next one we're going to look at is something called a similar triangles type relationship. And in a similar triangle type kinematic relationship, uh, that often results from a setup something like this. Here we have a horizontal bar that's rigid, and by rigid what I mean is it doesn't bend. And it has a load applied to the end of it, but there are two bars supporting this. We have bar one and we have bar number two. Now we could check, uh, we should do this, we should check to see if this is really statically indeterminate. To do that, we're going to draw a free body diagram of this horizontal bar. We have our applied load here. We have pin reactions, I'm going to call this AX and AY. And we have forces, F1 and F2. Now we're looking at this, and it, this one has four unknowns at this point. We do have some equations of statics we can apply, though. We can go the summation of forces in the x direction. All right, well, now we're down to three unknowns because AX is equal to zero. Summation of forces in the y direction, uh, AY plus F1 plus F2 is equal to zero. Obviously, uh, whoops, I need my 50. And we can do the summation of moments about a point. Maybe let's do point A. Now I put some dimensions on this structure. So uh, if I take this way positive, I'd have F1 times 1 meter. I would have F2 times 5 meters. And then I would have, going in the negative sense of rotation, 50 kilonewtons times, let's see, 5, 6, 7 meters. equal to zero for equilibrium. And in um, these kind of problems, we would often know the length of the bars, the diameter and the material properties. So these would be known quantities. We might be interested in finding the stresses in bars one and two, the axial stress the strains, the, the amount of movement or the amount of rotation of the bar. And uh, at this point, we have too many unknowns. We've done our statics. We need to use a kinematic relationship. And this is where this thing called similar triangles comes in. And what I mean by that, if we can imagine what would happen if we were to pull down really hard on this, bar one and bar two would stretch out, and the structure would pivot would rotate about the pin. I'm going to really exaggerate this so we can visualize what this would look like. That's way more deformation than what it would really have. But I want to do that so we can, can see this easily. The amount that this point is moving down is the amount of the stretching of bar number one. And the amount that this bar number two stretch down, uh, moves down is the stretching in bar number two. Now it happens that if this bar stays straight, that means it doesn't bend, if it's rigid in comparison to the, the bars one and two, then we can use something called a similar triangles relationship for the deformation between uh, one and two. Let's call this angle theta. One way to think of this is uh, the tangent of theta can be computed by E1 over one meter, or it could be computed by E2 over five meters. So this is known as a similar triangle type relationship. It's a very handy uh, proportionality relationship. Now, since the bar 1 and bar 2 have a constant cross-section material properties and force in them, we can put in our formula, F L over A E is equal to F L over A E for section 2, and then cross-multiply on these dimensions. 
we have one equation that's useful from our statics. We have a second equation that's useful from our mechanics and materials. We would solve those two equations for the two unknown forces. We've done this a couple times before. I won't do it now. We can find the stresses. We can find the strains in the bar. We can find that angle theta. We can find the uh, deformations of each bar. We can answer all kinds of questions once we figure out what those forces are. Now, in general, for statically indeterminate problems, and we will see these uh, show up for torsion problems and for bending problems as well, we always want to look for three things. We want to get as much as we can from statics. That'll help us out. Now, statics isn't enough if it's statically indeterminate. So we need to look at something called the geometry of deformation. Now, we just talked about how we can have these classifications, uh, series, parallel, or similar triangles. Most of the problems in your books will be one of those three types. And the third thing that we want to use is something called a load deformation equation. For us, in axial loading problems, that's going to be FL over AE. In fancy problems, you may have to do an integral. All right, let's do a couple examples with numbers, and there's some things that I want to point out that uh, will be easier to highlight when we do have numbers in these problems. Okay, so I'm just uh, making up some numbers here, and we'll use this as an example. What we want to do is we want to find the stresses in each of those segments, one and two, and maybe the displacement of point B at the junction where that load's applied. And uh, we can find strains or all kinds of other things that we want. So when we approach this kind of problem, the first thing we need to decide is, is it statically determinate or statically indeterminate? Now, if you have enough experience looking at these problems, you will recognize that it is statically indeterminate. But let's go through and talk about why that is. If we draw the free body diagram, we have a force on the left side, call that FA. And the force on the right side, I'll call FC. And we have the applied axial force, 10 kilonewtons. The FA and the FC are external reactions, and we only have an axial reaction because we only have axial loading. If we write down the equilibrium equation, the summation of forces in the x direction, we have minus FA plus 10 kilonewtons plus FC is equal to zero. We cannot find FA and FC only by using statics, so this is statically indeterminate. And we're in our section talking about statically indeterminate structures, so, so that makes sense too. But in, in general, you should be able to recognize if the structure is statically indeterminate by looking at it, or at least by drawing the free body diagram and counting the unknowns. Now then, our second thing we need to do is we need to classify this into one of our kinematic relationships. In this particular case, we're looking at this, and it's fixed in between two walls. And so our total deformation from one wall to the other is equal to zero. Bar number one might stretch out and bar number two might compress. But when we add those two together, they have the total to be zero. Okay. We know our load deformation relationship, FL over AE. So I will write that down for each section. Now, I have to be a little bit careful here. Remember when I said that uh, segment one probably stretches out and segment two probably gets shorter, but in this equation, I'm writing them down as if they're both getting longer. I have to be careful because when I do that, I have to make sure I show my free body diagrams in a way that's consistent with that assumption. What I mean by that is when I cut this over here, 
F1 is equal to FA. Look and see how that is a bar that's in tension. The sine of that free body diagram goes with the sine of that deformation. When I cut inside section number two, and I say that F2 is equal to FC, you see how this bar is in tension. I have to be careful when I show that free body diagram to be in tension, that's assuming that I have a positive sign in that location. If I switch my free body diagrams to point in their correct directions, then I have to switch the sign of the deformation. Here's my advice. Assume everything is positive. The signs will take care of themselves in the end. Uh, let me show you how that all works out. So here's my free body diagrams that I just drew. Let's put in the numbers that we know. We have uh, unknown F1. We have a length. Uh, well, let's, let's do this first. Let's do this with symbols. We have L2 over L1, A1 over A2, E1 over E2. Now let's put in the numbers. The lengths are one half on the top and one on the bottom in meters. Uh, the areas, pi over 4, 10 millimeters squared, divided by pi over 4, 5 millimeters squared. And the pi over 4s will cancel out. The fact that I didn't use meters is okay because there's millimeters squared on the top and the bottom. And then the moduli of elasticity, we have 200 gigapascals on the top and 70 gigapascals on the bottom. Let me get out my calculator and let's see what that number turns out to be in this particular case. I'm going to have 200 divided by 70. I'll have 10 squared divided by 5 squared. And I'll multiply that by 0.5. So I have 0, um, excuse me, I have 5.714 times negative F2. So this is going to be minus 5.714 F2. All right, so that tells me what F1 is equal to. Oops, F1 right here. Now that's still one equation with two unknowns, but my second equation comes from my equilibrium equation. And if you notice, I have minus FA plus 10 plus FC is equal to zero. That's equivalent to writing minus F1 plus 10 kilonewtons plus F2 is equal to zero. That's my second equation. I'm going to insert equation one into equation two. Now the negative sign there will cancel with the negative sign on the right hand side, so I'll have positive 5.714 F2 plus 10 plus F2 is equal to 0. If I rearrange this, then the 10 goes to the other side, that's a minus 10 on the right hand side, and I'll have 6.714 that I'll be dividing that into. So this should be F2 is equal to minus 1.49 kilonewtons. And if I do the multiplication here, 5.714 times 1.49, uh, that gives me F1 being a positive 8.51 kilonewtons. So another important thing to point out is the magnitude of both of these forces are less than 10 kilonewtons. We can never amplify our load in this kind of situation. If you come up with a situation where your internal forces are bigger than your applied load, go back and find your mistake. There's one in there somewhere. All right, now that we have those forces, we have numbers for those forces, then we can go and put in uh, force over area to give me my stress sigma 1. Now let's go ahead and do that. 8.51 times 10 to the 3 newtons divided by 
pi over 4 times the diameter squared. Now, this time I am going to convert this into meters. And let's see what kind of number we get. If I punched everything in correctly, I got 108.4 megapascals. In a similar way, we can find sigma 2 if we want. Uh, the other thing that uh, we can do is find the displacement or the movement of points along the length of the structure. If I want the displacement of B, what I would do would is start from my fixed end, which is this side or this side, if I start from point A, I go through all of the material of number one. And so the stretching of number one is the displacement of point B. Since bar number one is in tension, the displacement of point B will be to the right. Or, if I want, I can think of it from point C. How much does point B move? Well, it moves the same amount that bar number 2 gets shorter. And uh, we can figure that out. Now, the magnitudes of the deformation of E2 will be equal to the magnitude of the deformation of E1. However, number 2 gets shorter, number 1 gets longer. By looking at this picture, it's probably pretty easy to make sense that number 1 is going to be in tension. And if we look down at our result, we assumed it was intention, and we ended up with a positive result for our force. So it really is intention. Number two, by looking at this picture, should be in compression, the way that force is acting. If we look at our result, we had F2 is equal to minus 1.49 kilonewtons. Now, we assumed in our free body diagram that it was intention. A negative sign on a force means that the force really points in the opposite direction from our assumption. And so it would be in compression. All right, let's do another example. And in this example, we have a core and a sleeve type problem, and the core and the sleeve are bonded tightly together. If we look back at our notes, the way that I would classify the kinematic relationship for this problem would be it is materials in parallel. Materials in parallel have the same deformations. If I were to pull on the end of the bar with a thousand pounds, that bar would stretch out. Material one, number one would stretch out, and material number two would stretch out. If they're bonded together, their stretching would be the same. So the kinematic relationship would be E1 is equal to E2. The deformations are equal. Our load deformation equation is FL over AE in this case. We're going to have to be a little bit careful with the areas when we calculate it, and we'll use the numbers here uh, in a second. And then uh, uh, before we go too much further, let's go ahead and do some algebra and find our force in terms of the other force. So we have L2 over L1, A1 over A2, and we have uh, that should have been an E1 over here, divided by E2. Now, when I said we had to be careful about the areas, let's talk about that for a second. The, the lengths are the same. Those will cancel each other out. The area for bar number one, bar number one is the core. So the area is going to be pi over 4 times the diameter of number 1 squared. And number 2 is the sleeve. Now the sleeve by itself is hollow. So I have to account for that being hollow when I calculate the area. So I have 1 squared minus a half squared. Then I have 30 times 10 to the 3 KSI. And then I have 10 times 10 to the 3 KSI. Since I have the same units on the top and the bottom, I don't have to be so careful about making sure everything is in exactly pounds and inches. Those consistent units will cancel out. At this point, I have one equation in terms of two unknowns.
Let's go ahead and find the number for them while we're here. The pi over 4s will cancel out. And it's kind of handy to do the canceling out before you punch everything into your calculator because uh, it's easy to punch things into your calculator wrong. So we have uh, on the top 3 divided by 1. We have 0.5 squared. On the bottom we have 1 squared minus a half squared. Um, this problem has worked out to be a little bit unusual. It, um, it shouldn't, uh, yeah, I guess it did work out to be a little bit unusual. It turns out this ratio is 1. So 0.5 squared is a quarter. Multiplied by 3 is 0.75. And then when I take 1 squared minus 0.5 squared, uh, this is a little unusual. And maybe that's unfortunate that it worked out to be this way, but it just happened to be that F1 is equal to F2. Uh, typically that doesn't happen. I'm not going to go back and change the dimensions or change the material properties, but, but just be careful. Uh, don't always assume that the forces are equal. And let's make a big note about that. Generally, it, uh, and by chance meaning, I, I randomly picked a couple numbers to put in for these things, and it happened to work out that F1 and F2 are equal. Generally, they're not the case. Now, our second equation is going to come from the fact that the internal forces have to be related to the applied load. And again, when we do this kind of problem, we have to be careful about how we draw the free body diagram. If we cut it exactly at the wall and find the reaction at the wall is 1,000 pounds, although that's true, it's not helpful. So the equilibrium equation from this free body diagram is useful. It relates the internal forces to the external load. F1 plus F2 is 1,000. Uh, now, if we go ahead and do the algebra, now the algebra is easier. F2 is equal to 500 pounds in this case, and F1 is equal to 500 pounds in this case. Then uh, we can find the stresses in each piece. The stress in the core, that's number one, is going to be 500 pounds divided by pi over 4, 0.5 squared, inches squared. The axial stress in number two is F2 divided by A2, 500 pounds divided by, again, you have to be careful, the sleeve is hollow. So you have to account for that by taking uh, pi over 4 outside diameter squared minus inside diameter squared. If we want the total deformation of the structure, the total change in length, that would be either the deformation of the core or the deformation of the sleeve. And then you can do all sorts of things to play around with these types of questions. I could ask, what is the displacement of a point that lies halfway along the length of the bar? Well, that displacement would be half of E1 or half of E2. All right, so that's an example of materials in parallel. Now, I'll let you do an example on your own of statically indeterminate similar triangle relationships. It's very similar to the setup for materials in parallel. The only difference is for the similar triangles relationship is you have an additional coefficient that goes in front of the right-hand side of this expression. Uh, very similar. All right. So uh, there it is, statically indeterminate axial deformation. Now in the next lecture we're going to have thermal misfits on top, th uh, thermal stresses and misfits on top of being statically indeterminate. Um, that can be kind of complicated. The algebra gets to be worse, but the concepts are the same. So uh, I'll leave that for that lecture, and if you've got any questions, please contact me.